If you want to turn your Bible to the book of Revelation, chapter number 2, the book of Revelation, chapter number 2, we're going to continue where we left off, studying the churches of Asia Minor. So we begin in our study tonight in verse number 12, and we welcome any of our friends online. Happy New Year. If we haven't connected with you, pray the Lord will encourage you this year. Please know you are welcome to come and join us here in our services. Tonight is our midweek service where we take some time to pray for people's needs and listen to any testimonies that people might share. And then we want to teach the Bible. And so if you are in need of a Bible, please know we have some available. Just ask us. All right. Revelation chapter 3, verse 12. Excuse me. Beginning with verse 12, it says, And to the angel, that will be the messenger. It could be a reference to the pastor. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he, which hath the sharp, sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate? Repent, or else I come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Verse 17, and this is a very familiar statement, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The churches represent people, congregations. It does not represent buildings necessarily. It represents people that have professed to accept Jesus to receive him as their Lord and Savior. So as we go through uh, this particular church and what the Lord has to say according to what we just read, I pray that God would use it to speak to our hearts, to help us to see that these people in this time frame were challenged in a great way. And we're going to learn something about the people there in this church that hopefully it's my prayer that will help us take a step of faith take a position in our life that maybe we have not taken before. So with that, let's ask the Lord's help. We're glad that you're here tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We ask the Holy Spirit will guide us in our study of it. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to be able to minister to believers, to Christians throughout the ages. Thank you that you are able to save unto the uttermost that come unto faith in you. Now we pray your will be done. Speak to all of our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing and what you're going to do. We pray these things in Christ's precious name. Amen. So if you uh, missed out on the first two uh, sessions of our, our, of our teaching, we are reminded that God spoke to the churches in a great way. In the church of Ephesus, we are reminded that they had left their first love. Some have called them the loveless church. And then Smyrna was a church that um, remained faithful to God even during trying times, and they were persecuted as a result of it. They were the, some have said, the persecuted church. Now we come to the church of Pergamum or Pergamos. The word Pergamos there means height. It's the height of elevation. The very place where this city was, was on a very lifted up area that the people could see from afar off. Just to give you a little bit of the historical background, Pergamos had become the capital of this area of Asia Minor in 133 BC, and it was the capital for about 250 years. Historians tell us that this place, Pergamos, was the educational hub for the learning it was a very cultural uh, setting for that area. For example, in their libraries, they had over 200,000 volumes in its, in its place. Handwritten, if you please. Some people, like historians, 
saying that the pergamins develop animal skin parchment to write material. Parchments derived from perg pergamum in terms of linguistics. So let me read you something concerning their uh, place. It was an important center for culture and learning. It was known it was known the physician Galen, second only to prominence to Hippocrates, was born and studied in Pergamum. The city itself saw, saw itself as a defender of Greek culture in Asia Minor. There was a massive altar in that city built to Zeus and commemorating the victory of the Pergamians over the invading barbarian Gauls. It was an important center of worship. There were a number of deities there that were from the Greek Roman world and there were temples dedicated to Athena, Pespis, Dionysius and Zeus but overshadowing all those was a giant Ephesus devoted to the cult of emperor worship. That is the emperors of Rome, different leaders of the land. The first temple in Asia Minor dedicated to Roman emperor worship was erected in per Pergamum in 29 BC by the authorization of Augustus. This second temple of this kind was built in Smyrna in 26 AD. And the third one was in the temple of Sebaste Doi, formerly the temple of Domitian, which was dedicated in Ephesus in 89 AD under the reign of Emperor Domitian and the temple of Trojan with the fourth emperor cult temple to be built in the providence of of Asia. Now when you look at verse number 12, it, John writes the church in Pergamos. We don't know who started that church, but we do know that John the Apostle was pastoring the church at Ephesus. We believe church history is correct, that Polycarp was the pastor of the church in Smyrna. We do know that the Apostle Paul spent two full years in Asia Minor, according to Acts 19 and verse number 10. Now, what does God know about this church? As we mentioned, the church are people. They are an assembly meeting with a common denominator, and that is they profess to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. However, because of all the pagan idolatry and emperor worship, it was a very dangerous place for believers to grow and to try to honor their Savior. Because emperor worship was required by the people of the city to come and to offer incense to pagan deities once a year. And if you didn't do it, there is a possibility that you could face your own personal death. Many theologians believe, according to our text, that Antipas, who is mentioned in verse 13, is one of the men, one of the believers, one of the leaders of that day, they believe he's associated with John the Apostle who did not bow to emperor worship. So when you look at this church, these are people that have simply been saved by the grace of God, but were faced with choices that were very difficult in their current day. We believe Christians... If you're saved, you are saved by the wonderful grace of God. Amen? And it's by grace that you're saved that you continue to grow in, in the knowledge of God's Word and the grace of God. Keep in mind, everybody comes from different backgrounds. Keep in mind that the people of the city of Pergamos were used to, because of the culture, of bowing down to various deities. And I mentioned some of them here. You can go on YouTube and there's a prolifera of information available historically concerning this particular area. Paganism, idolatry, was at an all time. So if God saved you, if you heard the gospel from this town, you have some very difficult things, I'm talking about choices to make, to stand for truth and to stand for the Savior. When I look at this passage here, many have said the church of Pergamos was the compromising church. Why? What did they do? What does the Bible have to say about this particular church? Well, John says that they were 
involved with the doctrine of Balaam. And later on, we find another issue concerning the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. What is the doctrine of Balaam? Notice it says in verse number 14, But I have a few things against thee, because thou, have, thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Now, to get the insight into the name Balaam, you need to read the book of Numbers, but we're not going to do that tonight. Trust me with this. Balaam was gifted with the blessing of uh, being able to use his talents for God. But on this particular day, for whatever reason, and we believe the reason, is, according to 2 Peter 2.15 and Jude 1.11, was that Balaam was lusting for carnal things such as riches. And he would do this to help the king of Moab. And so what the king of Moab saw was the children of Israel coming through his area. And the king basically, if, if I may say it like this, got a little nervous, didn't want the children of Israel to be his neighbors. So Balaam got involved and, and Balaam was asked to do certain things, pray against his own people to use him in things, and it didn't work. So as a result, a decision was made to get some of the Moabitess people and uh, basically to be able to get the women out front, I don't know how they did this, maybe very seductively, and cause the men of Israel as they were journeying and to take note and eventually develop relationships, even sexual relationships, to the point that the men of Israel began to get involved with these women in an entangled relationship that ended up causing the children of Israel, the men folks and people in general, in their, in their camp, if you please, to commit such sins, such as idolatry, sacrificed unto idols. You say, is this something new? No, it's happened in church history. Think of Solomon, David's son. Remember Solomon? And uh, he was the guy that had a, a lot of uh, people under his wing, but he allowed, uh, you know, people to make choices, and he ended up involved with making decisions that basically drew his heart away and ended up worshiping in not a way that was pleasing to God. That's another sermon. According to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 15, Balaam's way was a choice to promote falsehood for financial reasons. The word in there in 2 Peter 2.15 is the wages of unrighteousness. According to Jude 1.11, Balaam's error was he was willing to allow pagan beliefs out of greed. And Jude 1.4 reminds us concerning these that did this, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness, that will mean immorality, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So you might say, when you look at the first three churches, the second church, Satan tried to infiltrate. The first church, he got people to go through the motions. That would be Ephesus. Jesus said they had left their first love. The second church, they remained faithful, and the Lord simply encouraged them to be faithful, not to be afraid of the things that will happen to them. And now he tries to attack the church here in Pergamos, and he couldn't do it. So in a sense, he entered. Someone said, if you can't beat him, what? Join him. So this was Satan's strategy. And I, I find it very interesting in verse number 13. Notice what the Lord says about this church. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is the throne of Satan. There was so much idolatry going on and pagan worship that the Lord recognized that the city of Pergamos was controlled by spiritual powers that Christians had to face. And so you had this teaching 
the doctrine of Balaam would allow, would promote false doctrine that would cause Christians to stumble. Believers would allow behavior amongst their congregation, allow teaching inside their, their circle that will make an impact that will hurt the church. One of the traits of false teachers in the church is that they tempt to turn Christian liberty into freedom to be promiscuous lifestyle. Is it true you can do whatever you want to do as a believer? I believe you can. You're not a robot. But listen to what Paul said in Romans 13 verse 14. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Just because you want to do something doesn't mean it's right, right? So in their case, the church of Pergamos allowed pagan beliefs to be mixed inside their fellowship, allowed, permitted, sinful activity. The Bible reminds us in 1 Peter 1, 13 and following, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. I think it's interesting that Peter writes, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. The mind and heart should be in sync with God. We are to protect, we are to guard all our heart with all our, with all our mind as well from ungodliness. God is holy. He says, be holy for I am the Lord. I am holy and have severed you from other people that you should be mine. Leviticus 20 verse 26. I remember uh, this past uh, Father's Day after having leaving church here, went home and there was two dads at my house on that day. And so we we're going to have just a simple uh, Father's Day luncheon. We got some meat on the grill. And about halfway into that experience, it began to rain like cats and dogs. Then it began to flood. And before you knew it, I was in my so-called dress clothes that I thought I didn't have to change out of into the ditches right behind my house. And if you saw me that day, you would have said, what in the world are you doing? I, my pants were all muddy. I was wet from head to toe. I looked a mess. I was dirty. I had mud all over my shoes, mud on my, my clothing. And spiritually speaking, when the church of Pergamos allowed uh, doctrine that was wrong, allowed activity that was wrong, they thought that it would be okay. A little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. In other words, they took this attitude that, hey, it's not a big deal. Let me ask you right here, is sin a big deal? Is sin, is sin, can sin affect you? Yep. Yes, it can. We are not an island to ourselves. The church at Pergamos was allowing the doctrine of Balaam, uh, causing believers not to be indistinguishable from the unbelieving world. According to 1 Peter 2, 9, we are supposed to be peculiar people. If you look in the dictionary, it could be defined as uncommon, odd, or strange, but in an alter Alternative definition means this, and I quote, belongs exclusively to some person, group, or thing, or to refer to, quote, a property or privilege belonging exclusively or characteristically to a person, end quote. And if you belong, if you're saying you belong to who? You belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, right? You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify, that is, honor God in your body, in your spirit, which are God's. I think it's interesting that Peter said, you're a peculiar people. The church in Pergamos lost that. Some of them did. They didn't want to look different than the world amongst them in character, perhaps, and in conduct. Matthew goes on to say in Matthew chapter 5, this is Jesus speaking. He says, but ye are the salt of the earth. 
But if the salt have lost its savior, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast down and to be trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but under a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Another way the doctrine of Balaam is, is a belief that a little sin doesn't hurt especially if there's a, some financial or personal benefit involved. We know that everyone's going to pay a price for their faith in following Jesus. In, wish, in Western Christianity, and I'm talking about here in America, the doctrine of Balaam is viewed as that a Christian can or even should compromise their so-called convictions for the sake of popularity, money, sexual gratification, or personal gain. I said this before, but they possess an attitude and treat a sin as it's no big deal. Nobody, including myself, nobody gets away with sin. God sees it all. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. We live in this world, but all the world has to offer is not always good. There's debauchery. There's wicked influence. There's idolatry still. And our country is loaded with these things. And we must continue to let our light shine. And if you're not aware of this, I believe that we idolize so much in our country. We idolize entertainment. We idolize sports figures. We popularize things that are only temporal, such as money. And the list goes on. The Bible reminds us that, that one of the wisest men recorded for us in Ecclesiastes 12, after he experienced life and had all so many experiences, this is what he had to say. Let us whole, hear the whole conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So what does the Lord have to say to this church? We find that Antipas was martyred. There was religion there was idolatrous worship. There was a teaching going on that affected the camp, that affected the people. In verse 15, it goes on to say, So hast thou also then that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which they not hate. Many believe this will be in reference to the leaders of, this, of their day. They will have this prominence of power in leadership. Do as I say and not as I do. They were not of the, their doer's version. And the Lord wants us to become doers of the word and not hearers only. There's a lot more that I could say right there, but let's get in closing to here. There are consequences for compromising with sin. Notice how God speaks to this church in verse number 12. He says, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. Now, wouldn't it be interesting, like one man said, if a letter was addressed to you, the man with a two-edged sword is speaking to you. <laughs> Sounds sort of threatening, scary, right? In the other two previous churches, it's not said anything like this. So something is different. Something is going on in this church. And the Lord expounds, expounds or exposes what's taking place. Do you believe the Lord knows what's going on in our lives? Yes, he does. So the message to the church is a message of warning. The, the reference there in Revelation chapter 2, verse 12, about the sharp sword is also mentioned in the first chapter, in chapter 1, in verse 16, when he said, And he had it in his right hand, seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. It's also brought in Revelation 19, at the physical revelation of Jesus, when he comes down to this earth. The Bible says, And out of his mouth go a sharp sword, that, it should, that he should smite the nations, and shall rule them with a rod of iron. He treaded the winepress of the fierceness, of the wrath of Almighty God. This is a warning of judgment that could be coming. And is it true that judgment must begin at the, at the house of God? 
We know according to the Bible, God is going to deal with the unsaved man. But of what about the believer? Peter writes, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God and at first begin at us what shall be of them that obey not the gospel of God. 1 Peter 4.17 So what is God's answer? Number one, repent. Look at verse 16. Repent. What does that mean? It has this idea of a change of mind about the teachings of Balaam and the Nicolaitans. God's people rather should stand for the truth, should stand for righteousness, should stand for the goodness of God. Even testify of that wonderful truth that we learn in the righteousness of God and God's goodness, even when people might not like want to hear. Think about Jesus' ministry for a moment. During the public ministry of our Lord, think about the woman that he met at the well. It's recorded for us in John 4. Jesus said to her, Go call thy husband. Come hither. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he to whom thou hast not is not thy husband, and that sayest thou truly. Have you ever had a conversation and you asked someone and said, Is that your husband? Or is that your wife? Put them an uncomfortable situation. The Lord Jesus dealt with this. And of course he spoke the truth in how? In love. He was concerned for their ultimate welfare. In John 8 verse 11, the Lord said, concerning the woman caught in the very act of adultery, she said, after Jesus said, Had no man condemned thee, she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. No people can do a lot of prejudging, but we must remember that Jesus is the compassionate Savior. He wants me to act just like He did. Give people the benefit of the doubt. You never know what they're dealing with. According to Acts 24, when Paul was preaching, he spoke to the leaders of his day, and they heard him concerning his faith in Christ, and he reasoned of righteousness and temperance and judgment to come. Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. The church at Pergamos reminds me of the times as believers we could be tempted not to let our light shine for Christ. We could be tempted to allow something simple that we're permitting or we're listening to doctrinal air, something we shouldn't be listening to. Spurgeon said this concerning compromise. I believe the one reason why the church of God is, at this present moment has so little influence over the world is because the world has too much influence over the church. I would agree with that to some degree. J.C. Ryle mentions we should no more tolerate false doctrine than we should tolerate sin. And A.B. Simpson tells us the chief danger of the church today is that it's trying to get on the same side as the world instead of turning the world upside down. Think of what the Lord has to say to this church in verse 16. Repent, that it has, have a change of mind, change of heart about the things you're allowing, the things you're compromising, you're compromising with spiritual decisions that are sinful. Repent or else I come unto thee quickly. So there is an urgency. Repent if you're compromising, stop it. Judgment could be coming your way. Recognize Judgment, God's no respecter of person. He can, can bring the disciplined hand upon his own children, yea, even death. Repent quickly. Do it today. Decide who you're going to honor. Who are you following? We sing that song every once in a while. I have decided to follow who? Jesus. When you follow Jesus, he will guide you into all truth. He will not lead you into error. He will not lead you into compromise. That is, compromise with sin, those things that are wrong. So repent. Repent quickly. And then, thirdly, return to a right relationship to the Lord by obeying His truth. And the only way to recognize false teaching 
and be cognizant of this to be familiar with the truth through a diligent study of the Word of God we call the Bible. So the church at Pergamos there, they allow things in their life. Can I ask you right here? Don't answer out loud, but is there anything that you're allowing in your life that you know is outright wrong? I would encourage you, confess it, forsake it. God still loves you. Repent, in other words. Are you allowing anything in your life that you shouldn't? Are you trying to mix something in your life like they did? As, and trying to justify and say, they're doing it, he's doing it, she's doing it, I'm okay. But all along, maybe God has been dealing with you and, and there's no peace in your heart. I'm so thankful that God of the Bible is forgiving. God of the Bible loves me. And if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if you've never been saved, I'll say this, Christ died for the church, for the people at Bergamus. Christ died for those in the church of Smyrna. Christ died for those in the church of Ephesus. And the Bible says, for God so loved the what? The world that he gave his only begotten son. That would include anybody here tonight. That would include all your friends. That would include those that have yet to be saved. The gospel, the good news is Christ died for them shed his blood, was buried and rose on the third day after dying a murderous, a criminal death through crucifixion. He's our Savior tonight. He's alive. He's a resurrected Lord. And so with that, we're going to continue the study in the churches of Asia Minor. And Lord willing, we're going to look at the church of Thyatira next time, the, the adulterous church, some have said. And so with that, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray the Holy Spirit will continue to work in your people, our hearts, continually this year. Lord, help us to draw near to you. Help us to know what the truth is and to yield to it. Thank you. Thank you for protecting us. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your love. Save that one who is yet to receive you as Savior. Guide us throughout this week. Help us to make the decisions that are honorable to you. Lord, we'll thank you for what you do. For we ask all these things in Christ's precious name. And all God's people can say, Amen, amen and Amen.